Well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending the member update. There is a lot to talk about from 2021 and what we're looking at for 2022 as the consortium does a little retrospective and a little looking forward. So um, feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat window and Members of the consortium staff will be monitoring that and answering questions if they can or stopping me if it's something that um, they would like me to answer. But why don't we go ahead and get started. So my name is Matt Seaman. I'm the executive director of the Consortium for Service Innovation. And today we are definitely gonna take a little bit of time to talk about all the great things that member companies focused on in 2021. And a little bit of a preview into some of the things we'll be working on in 2022 based on continuation of some of the work that is obviously being done already. But some of the ideas that have come out of different discussions with member companies and things that some of the leaders at member companies are looking to talk about as we go into 2022. So the consortium is a not-for-profit industry association and really looking to pursue innovative ways to kind of improve customer engagement. You'll maybe start to see us move away from experience more towards engagement as we go into 2022 as well. But it's all of you as brave members of the consortium that do all the heavy lifting and actually do all the work and test models, operation, bring back your operational experiences, which helps other member companies operationalize their experience or sharing of ideas. So the consortium is really focused on this idea of bringing people together to have interesting discussions that help us move the industry forward. And we have the KCS Academy, which reaches out to that broader community. There are thousands and thousands of people around the world that are really engaged with KCS and transforming their companies using the KCS principles and core concepts and practices. The Academy focuses on reaching out and supporting that community. All the certifications for KCS, the online courses, and supporting all of our amazing partners around the world that are out there spreading the great word of intelligent swarming in KCS to the global audience. There's six of us on staff for the consortium, and um, they're all on the phone today except for Arnpin, who has a uh, conflict and couldn't attend today. We love shepherding the work of the consortium members and listening to all the consortiums and bringing back all your great ideas and trying to coordinate more conversations with everybody. And we had quite a milestone this year by adding Sarah Feldman to the staff in July. And she has had a great impact already on the consortium staff, how we're engaging the members and has really refreshed some of our digital footprint, I would say, and how we're trying to reach out to the greater audience. So it was great getting to add Sarah this year and having her engage with everybody. The consortium is really made up of a lot of uh, fantastic companies. This is a snapshot of some of the 65 member companies that we have. And it is the member companies that are out there being brave and testing things and trying everything. We had the absolute pleasure of adding 18 new member companies in the last little over 12 months. Um, but some, some great new names that we got to welcome to the consortium. Some people coming back to the consortium like Cisco after a bit of an absence. And it's great to have Cisco back into the fold. They're doing really some amazing innovative work at Cisco and we're excited to have them back. But some of the members and um, some of the new members have really been supporting the consortium and the work of the consortium presenting at different events. And thank you to all of our members for making 2021 an absolutely amazing year and all of the support that you give to the consortium and the work that you're doing. We organize our work into five main buckets, but they all interconnect. You really can't talk about one without it kind of bleeding into another. KCS, obviously the one we are most known for and the one that is a focus of many, many of the members. Intelligence swarming is taking off though. We're seeing more companies 
implementing intelligence forming and doing a lot of work around how we do recognition intelligence forming and pushing some of the boundaries of organizational design. The predictive customer engagement, focusing on machine learning and AI and how they can impact the way we're engaging our customers and getting much more predictive to get out in front of problems before our customers even know that they have them. And how do you do that if you aren't capturing information and knowledge? And this is where they all start to tie together. It's hard to be predictive if you don't have KCS in place. I'm not sure what you're gonna train your machine with if you're not capturing information, knowledge, and data. Um, the customer experience initiative, which over, overlays everything that we do. And you're definitely gonna see the customer experience initiative shifting to the customer engagement initiative. There are a lot of great organizations and a lot of really skilled people at experience and UX design. We're focused more on the engagement and thinking about our engagement with customers, customers being anybody. It doesn't have to be just external, but can be internal and external. But how do we engage um, in all the different channels and all the different ways that we do? And leadership and adaptive organization has been, I'd say, a super fun topic for the last, last 18 months as we went to distributed workforces, as hiring practices started to change, the idea that you don't need to hire people in an office setting anymore, all of these things have really challenged some of the way we think about leadership and um, what the role of a leader is in, or in an organization. So some really great work going on with leaders at a lot of member companies around what does an adaptive organization look like? What does it take to build a resilient organization? And you'll see some of that in the work of 2021 and 2022. As always, the consortium is looking to build a space for people to get away from their day-to-day -day job and kind of step away from the fact that every day we're dealing with firefighting, all kinds of things going on. But how do we get out of that and share ideas. And I love this quote around that once I have a new idea, I can't go back to not knowing that idea. Once we share an idea, once we share some information, once I learn something new, I can't unlearn that. I may forget it. I maybe forget things every now and then, but I don't unlearn it. So this idea that the consortium is about bringing people together to stretch each other's minds, share and learn from each other is what our events are about. And it's a place for people to come and share share their information and share their knowledge. And the consortium really is about people. While we all work at companies and we have a company membership model, it really is the people that are creating the value by being willing to share all of their different experiences and, and bring their skills to the table and having these diverse perspectives come together and openly learn from and share with each other. And that's what sparks new ideas and innovation. And it's really the power of the consortium and the power of our members coming together is the high trust environment that we have with each other and the willingness to share. And this topic of innovation we're actually having some discussions. We had some discussions earlier about innovation because we think of innovation, when you say the word innovation, everybody kind of thinks of this crazy idea or something that nobody else has ever thought of. But what we see the spark of innovation being that I'm learning something that maybe is super innovative to me. Maybe a company has done this and they're pretty mature at it, but my company has never heard of it or I've never heard of it and it's super innovative to me. But everybody, every company, every person in a company knows something somebody else doesn't know. And sharing all of those ideas together is really what drives new ideas and builds on the foundation we have in the consortium to continue to push boundaries. But it's all of you on the call today and all of the people at all the member companies that we have that really are energizing and passionate and super thoughtful about the work. And um, thank you again to everybody for your contributions to making this so successful. How do we engage? Um, we really are an event-based organization, I would say. We use event in a very generic and broad, broad way. Uh, we pretty much call everything we do an event. So I'm not sure we, they're all events, but we call them all events. We kind of start at a broad engagement level around things like the member summit, our webinars, our KCS practitioner webinars, which span from innovative concept discussions to sharing best practices or new ideas or addressing some challenge that I have super deep into 
what are we doing around implementations with KCS? Um, you know, how do I sustain a KCS environment? What does coaching look like? How am I doing measures? Really broad topics that are designed to kind of reach out to a large audience. And then we start to get a little more focused when we have our program team meetings, which are two to three day interactive working sessions, either on an exploratory topic or on a specific idea. So it's not a specific topic that we necessarily talk about. Um, but we usually bring together a smaller group of people, maybe 20 people come to a program team meeting to really talk about a, a topic that they're passionate about. And we use techniques like open space and design thinking to really talk about what the members want to talk about, what you want to talk about at events, and then capture that information. And that's what leads to a lot of our other events or a lot of the working groups or community of practice that get created. And these groups are where we are truly iterating, testing, and operationalizing specific practices. So we have about five working groups going on. And we uh, are thinking about the things that we might have working groups around in 2022. We then have two events that are a little bit more focused on leadership topics and how we engage the industry leaders. The leadership committee meeting, which is for our sponsor and benefactor level members. And this is where we review the work of the consortium and the topics that leaders wanna talk about, capturing that is often what leads to the new topics for the next year. <clears throat> so as we're thinking about 2022, a lot of things we'll be talking about in 2022 came out of the leadership committee meeting that we had in December. And the executive summit, which looks at what are the trends for the next several years? What's the nature of work look like in our industry? Industry, again, being pretty broad with what we work on these days. Um, but really, what are the things that leaders are thinking about? What is keeping them up at night? What trends are they seeing in their parts of the world? What trends are they struggling with? What are some of the emerging workforce um, challenges? So any of those topics are discussed at the Executive Summit. And we have our Slack channel, which any member can get access to the Slack channel. So if you uh, are a member of the consortium and not in the Slack channel, I would highly recommend that you reach out to us to get added to the, the Slack workspace. It's a great place to share ideas and ask questions on any number of topics, whether it's coffee, booze, or KCS. It's a great place to just come and hang out and learn from people that are doing things similar to the, the work that you're doing. And again, if you're not a part of the Slack channel, absolutely reach out to us and we can, uh, we can get you added to the Slack channel. Twenty twenty one was really uh, an amazing year of engagement. I probably am going to say the word amazing 900 times during this, this, uh, this session because it is really inspiring with how people engaged in 2021. We hosted a lot of webinars, 17 different companies, well over 1,500 people attended the webinars talking about a broad range of topics. We had our team meetings, dozens of companies, hundreds of people coming together throughout the year to talk about specific topics or explore new ideas. And we had our working groups, which delivered really tangible bodies of work, which are now publicly available to anybody. Most of the consortium's work is available through Creative Commons licensing, meaning as long as you're not using it for a commercial application, we make it uh, available to the world. And just countless connections between different member companies, connections with the global certified trainer network, and, and people that aren't necessarily a part of the network that we got to welcome to the network. And one of the positive impacts of going to a complete virtual world is we got to meet a whole new group of people that we never would have met at in-person events. It opened up the community to a much broader audience when you don't need to get budget to travel, you don't need to take three days out of the office. So we've met thousands of new people in 2021 and we're still trying to digest all of the notes and the open space topics that we uh, captured during all of the events last year. I makes my head spin when I look at how much we captured last year. And um, we've, as a staff, we've spent some time starting to 
try and organize it into grouping of topics and what that might look like for 2022. So and I don't know if there are any, oh, sorry, go ahead. Most go ahead. of it is available to members on the wiki. That was the other um, sort of big uh, benefit of moving to a virtual world is we are, were able to record um, many more things than we have in the past. So we have um, recordings, presentations, uh, notes, all kinds of things are available to members in the wiki. And if you need help getting access, we'll put a link and an email address in the chat. Once again, highlighting the uh, impact that our members are having and the sharing that took place in 2021, we had um, we actually ended up with 21 web sessions. So I probably need to go back and update the, the slide because after I created that slide, we did more web sessions. Um, but again, a host of topics and really a big thank you to the companies, member and non-member companies that came together to talk about and share where they are in their journey, whether it's leveling up your, your KCS program or how you do coaching in a mature environment. Amazing, again, amazing amounts of information. As Kelly said, all these presentations and a lot of the videos of people presenting are available in the wiki to kind of go back and reference the, the discussions that we had and the presentations during the different web sessions. And we already have web sessions planned out into 2022. So please check out the events page. It is going to start being updated pretty regularly with the upcoming events and the upcoming web sessions that will be held. So make sure you're paying attention to the events page and the newsletters for the upcoming events that, um, that our members are going to, be, going to be presenting at. Our bi-monthly team meetings, bi-monthly, we mostly have them bi-monthly. Sometimes we have them more than that, sometimes less than that, depending on the time of year. Some very exploratory and interesting topics in 2021. The discussion with uh, John Stevens Hall introducing us to systems engineering and complex adaptive systems has continued to, I'd say, drive a new line of thinking around how we can think about our organizations and how we can think about knowledge as a product or knowledge as a service. And this is something that is, uh, I'd say a growing topic for 2022 is thinking about the products of service organizations, whether it's a, a human resources organization, an IT organization, a technical support organization, the real product is knowledge. And how do we use that in an adaptive organization and an adaptive system? So this, is, this one meeting led to a whole new line of thinking, which is very exciting. Knowledge-centered success. So thinking about the next next generation of knowledge as really managing our corporate me memory and a strategic approach. Thinking beyond KCS as you know specific to a support or a services organization, but how do we use the core concepts, the principles, the ideas behind the practices across the enterprise? And there are member companies that are starting to play with building organizations to think about KCS and how it applies across an entire enterprise and really bringing it to every part of a company. And we had some consortium conversations around encour encouraging curiosity. How do you think beyond the interaction in front of you? So often we get so focused on the task at hand that we lose sight of what we're trying to accomplish, the big why. We rarely run into the People that are starting with the big why, they're always starting with the, you know, how, but, you know, how do we think about things a little bit further down the road? Some great discussions and notes captured, uh, lots of different maps and uh, side conversations started from the team meetings. There have been a lot of members that have continued to talk about some of this. And in 2022, hopefully we'll hear where they are in their journey on these things. Three tangible bodies of work that I, I mentioned and are now publicly available um, through the library, as Kelly pointed out. Understanding success by channel. We are forever expanding how we interact with our customers and the interaction with our customers is getting, I would say, more complicated, not less complicated. So how do you really design and think about all of the channels of engagement that you have with your customers and how do you measure success in those different channels 
So a body of work that members have been kind of starting to put together is how do we measure the success within a channel? In 2021, we added communities as a channel of success and some of the measures to think about for success within the community within a support organization. So we're not trying to redesign how community managers think about success of a community, but how would a support organization think about success within a uh, organization. And I love this uh, 4D model from Christina at Akamai around are we making our measures digestible, durable, defensible, and don't double count? And I think it's a great thing to line up against your measures and say, are these things true or are they not true? And if you get all four as true, then you're in great shape. If you don't get all four true, maybe you need to think about your measures a little bit more. But it's a, it's a great simple thing that I know I use all the time when I'm talking to different member companies. And this is a body of work that will continue in 2022 if you're interested in working on this. Feel free to reach out to us. Arnfin is kind of leading this effort. And uh, so feel free to reach out to us and we can get you connected to the group that's working on it. This, I just want to um, add a little something here. The, the aim of this whole project is really to put into context the value that we can get from the information that we capture in our assisted support channel. So really sort of looking at a fairly kind of one screen um, snapshot uh, of the things that if we do KCS right, if we are capturing in the workflow and we are um, creating knowledge and linking knowledge, uh, the ways that we can extend that and what that looks like in context for our organization. So we hear a lot of um, questions about how do I benchmark against other companies? How do I know if this is working? And we find um, it in this uh, conversation, which started in 2019, back, back in the olden days when we could get together in person, um, we find that benchmarking against yourself is much more um, actionable. And so this gives you a way to kind of do it on, on a single screen. It's, it's pretty great. There's some great information. Put a link to, the, to this paper in the chat. And there's some great information about how to get some of these measures and what, what it is that we're sort of looking for um, and how, how to get there. So thanks. Another published body of work, when I say published, it's something we still need to engage with people on and is, is maturing. But this idea of a measurement health framework, and we've captured a very long comprehensive list of the measures that companies are using in their services and support organizations. And this framework is designed to say, how are we using our measures? Are we using them the way we should be using them? Do we understand why we're using them? And do our measures align to our organizational goals? Are we recognizing the right behaviors with our measures? And, and are we using them the right way? And I'm sure nobody on this call has a whole bunch of dashboards that they look at with a whole bunch of pretty metrics that they look at it and then they don't really know what to do with it. So a number changed. Is there an action we're taking because the number changed? Are we just looking at this as a trend? Is it driving a behavior? This is a framework that helps you go through your measures and try to assess how you're using them and are we using them healthy. It is not a laundry list of measures that we are recommending everybody put in place. And that is, I think, one of the one of the concerns I have with this is that people are going to look at it as, oh, these are all the measures I need to put in place. And once I have these measures in place, in place I'm measuring the right thing. That is not the intent of this work. So it's emerging. We've had, uh, I think, four member companies now play around with it. And we're definitely looking for some other members that would like to engage with us on it and think through it and see how it works so we can continue to mature it. But um, I, I, I believe there's a lot of power in this framework and it's something that would have a, a lot of impact on how people think about measuring and what they're measuring. Nurturing an adaptive workforce. This is a topic that came out of a open space um, an open space question that I believe was David Kay, I think, asked a question and that led to people coming together and thinking about what does it take to nurture an adaptive workforce? And it's a, a great paper. It's not a very long read, but it talks to what are those cultural prompts that we want to have to align our team to adaptive qualities? And what are some of the things to think about when interviewing 
what I like about it, it's not only if you're a company interviewing somebody, but say I'm interviewing with somebody, what are the things I want to look for to make sure that they fit my culture and this is a place I want to work? So it looks at it from both angles. And what are those emergent patterns that leaders want to see and how do they create the conditions to drive those emergent patterns, which is connecting to our idea of an, um, organizations as adaptive systems. But uh, it's a super interesting paper to read and is uh, something that we'll continue to work on and continue to mature as well as we go through 2022 and beyond. And I'm very excited to kind of announce that we have the KCS V6 resources now in German. Uh, so available in the library is a English to German glossary of KCS terms. Hard to believe that some of the terms we use don't necessarily translate perfectly into other languages. Um, the KCS V6 principles and core concepts and the KCS V6 practices guide has now been translated into German and just a huge thank you to Tamara and Kai from ProSSEO for doing that translation. They did the translation and then gave us back the translation for publishing. So just a huge thank you to uh, Kai and Tamara for their one, just overall support of the consortium and methodologies, but for taking the time and energy on their own to translate the guide so that we can kind of expand its usage. So thank you to the two of them, but super excited to announce this today that it's it's been translated and is available in the library. We are 100% open to hosting other translations. So there is <laughs> there is another, um, there's a one pager in Spanish, uh, and that is the extent of our multi-language uh, offerings at this time. If there are community members who would like to translate some things, um, we're just super happy to host them. So let us know. And as Kelly has pointed out, all of this is in the library. So there's a lot of information available to as public resources around intelligence forming and obviously KCS. Uh, as a member, you can get access to the members only part of the library. And it has everything that we've just talked about. If you're a KCS trainer, there's a section for KCS trainers. But um, if you don't have access, please reach out to us and um, we can add you. It's really is a, a really strong resource. I know I go back and reference things all the time, looking for a presentation I remember seeing or some slides I remember, or, oh, I remember that these were topics in open space. Let me go back and review the Google Docs that have all the open space topics in them. So it, it's a great resource. So please uh, take advantage of it if you're a consortium member. And if you're not a consortium member, there is still a lot of great resources available for you. We've continued to have really strong relationships with um, with the industry and industry partnerships. And you know, we've got our aligned service providers, which are people that have a lot, you know, their services aligned to the KCS principles and practices. We have DBK and Associates and Thrive with Dr. Beth. Thrive with Dr. Beth supports a lot of the coaching work that we're doing. She's been a, a huge resource for our, our coaching efforts around um, KCS. Our aligned vendors, so these are tools that support some of the KCS V6 practices um, and great partners here that, that help us think through how the practices can be put into um, practical applications and really are doing great things to support how you can get access to knowledge, how you can use AI in to um, you know, serve up information. So some great vendors there. And our verified vendors, it's not easy to become a verified vendor because being verified means that your tool supports all eight of the KCS practices. And it's a challenge to get there and a challenge to keep it. Um, so big thank you to our verified vendors for you know, supporting the spreading of KCS and making sure that we have tools that are, are there to kind of really help us make the, the practices come to life. We like to point out that, you know, you can't just buy a tool and all of a sudden KCS magically works, but having the right tool certainly helps you make KCS and a lot of the other methodologies work. So uh, a big thank you to all of our industry partners. 
We have a great group of certified KCS trainers. So if you are looking for any type of KCS training, um, there's a list of all the externally certified KCS trainers available on the Academy website, as well as a list of the upcoming public work workshops. And I, I personally feel that the public workshops are a great way to kind of do a refresh on KCS. So say you've had KCS running for a while, or you've got a whole new host of people that are engaging with um, KCS, but you don't have any internal trainers. It's a great way to send people to kind of just get a refresh on the, the practices of KCS. So highly recommend that people take advantage of the public workshops that are out there. And if you're looking for specific uh, training or implementation, then connect with some of the KCS trainers near you. Um, it's, it's a great resource that we have out there for making people successful. Our online learning center has continued to mature in 2021. Thank you to the efforts of um, Arnfin Ostfjord and Jennifer Morkat. The two of them have really spent a lot of time on getting it to be more usable putting the the new tool in place and it really is part of a well-rounded kcs program and it's there to support kcs and soon to uh, support intelligent swarming but we've made it easier to purchase courses the interface has been streamlined and we'll be adding new courses in 2022 but if you're you know working with certified implementers if you um are doing you know kcs long term it's just some great resources that can help you with the well-rounded kcs program so arnfin and jennifer have done a great job of making this a, a more accessible resource for for our members and non-members in 2022 we're going to be adding some digital badges to the consortium portfolio. So really starting with badges around the KCS fundamentals, practices, and KCS trainers. We'll be using Credly for those digital badges, but bringing a little bit of more modern recognition to what it takes to become certified as a you know KCS V6 practices person or as a trainer. And then as we kind of get into the year and get used to Credly a little bit more and roll out the badges, we're looking at, you know, learning and completion badges around if I've completed the digital transformation fundamentals or the managing in a digital economy fundamentals. Um, recognition badges for, you know, being a consortium innovator or a consortium member company. So we'll be looking to add those, but in Q1, on adding the badges for um, kind of our, our core certifications. And I don't believe the badges will look like these. I think we've kind of kind of just made those badges up for the presentation. So I'm not sure what the actual badges look like. So now to shift gears a little bit and look towards 2022 and staying adaptive in 2022. I'm not sure I would call it a trend yet, but one of the things that we've had discussions with people about um, members, non-members, some of the academic community that we're engaged with is the shift that took place in the early days of the pandemic in support services and technology companies was incredibly impressive. And there was no roadmap and there was no plan for what happened to all these companies, but everybody adapted overnight to new working practices, new hiring practices, new way about thinking about things. And now that we are seeing people going back into the office that the, um, I don't know if it's the next normal, the new normal, whatever you wanna call it, but some of these things have now, I'd say, I'm not gonna say things have stabilized, but we're getting used to it. People are kind of falling back into their comfort zone of the way they were working before the pandemic. Well, how do we stay adaptive? How do we continue to think differently? How do we continue to push the boundaries? And, you know, the complexity in the world, the uncertainty in the world is not going to get less. It's increasing. Uh, it's a great Harvard Business Review article um, that talks about this. But as organizations, as leaders, as companies, how do we really mobilize our people? Because it's our people that do things. Companies don't do anything. People do things. So how do we really mobilize people and 
use all of the skills and competencies and um, things that we bring to the table as well-rounded humans to create innovative solutions to all show up as leaders. So this is a topic that we're going to continue to explore as we think about our adaptive organization, um, our organizations as adaptive. At the member summit, we had the pleasure of Caitlin Frost from Harvest Moon coming to talk about our limiting beliefs and how our limiting beliefs get in the way of change and innovation because we like to live in our comfort zone. We like to find things that support our beliefs instead of challenge our beliefs. And in times of change and times of innovation and when we need to be thinking about how we're going to do things differently, what are some of the tools and techniques we can use as people to get past our own limiting beliefs? And one of the exercises that she did with the people at Member Summit, which uh, I see just from the participants list, I know many of you were there. She just had us in the chat window in Zoom write words that one first reflected where I did not show up as feeling like I was showing up with the right presence or being helpful, or there was a leader that showed up and wasn't helpful. What are the words that come to your mind? And then what are the words that come to your mind when you think about a leader who showed up and really was inspiring and helped you? And then Kelly built a word cloud based on that. And I use these because I think they're, they're reflective of organizations and environments that we would all like to be in. We'd much rather be in an organization and an environment where I can show up and be calm. I can be patient. I'm empathetic versus I'm showing up to shame people and be defensive and negative. So really, I thought two powerful word clouds and this idea and thinking that leadership is not a title. Often when we talk about leadership and leadership qualities, we think about management or we think about executives in companies. But every single person is a leader that shows up every single day. So how do we as people show up, no matter what our title is, no matter what our role is, with some leadership qualities? Um, so I, I love this body of work from, from Caitlin and what we did at the Member Summit. We pushed the boundaries a little bit at the Member Summit in, in our comfort levels by doing some exercises around this as well. So it was, uh, I think, what the consortium is about, pushing the boundaries and pushing us outside of our own comfort zones. As we look at adaptive organizations, uh, and we have in the members wiki, many presentations now on this idea of a system that is a complex adaptive system and that we can't control all of the interactions. There's too many interactions. So how do we create the right environment to influence interactions to get the right emergent patterns? As we look at the body of work of the consortium, we're reorganizing it a little bit to think about the principles of an adaptive organization, uh, being abundance, creating value, demand-driven, and trust. And then we have practices and techniques. And we think about all the bodies of work of the consortium. And when you stitch them together, it really does build an adaptive organization. Intelligence swarming is 100% about building an adaptive organization, unlocking an unbounded network of skills, making it so anybody can interact with anybody. It's an environment of adaptability. So intelligence swarming truly builds an adaptive organization. KCS is about building content and context in the workflow. So how we're doing all of this is based on interaction. And system-wide patterns start to emerge from the knowledge we're capturing that can help us change how we're interacting with our customers. It can help us change how we're interacting with our software development or our manufacturing or our engineering departments. So KCS is a great way to build all that con content and context and find new patterns that emerge. I mean, the predictive customer engagement is literally about how do I build emergent patterns based on data that I'm seeing. The entire thing is a double loop model that makes you helps you think through how do I use all of this great data to design emergent patterns and then leverage that information to um, you know, make those patterns more successful for our customers? And then leadership in an adaptive organization, focusing in on the why. Management is really there to set the guardrails for a system, not how you're supposed to interact and do your job. We talk about that managers need to change from feeling like they're owners of something to being coaches and facilitators. Leadership in an organization that is really adaptive is about how do we focus on the why? How do we make it clear on the outcomes we're expecting? But we hire super smart people. We hire people that are capable of doing what we're hiring them to do. How do we let them do their job 
and build the guardrails and the outcomes and the why that lead to the patterns that we're looking for. So when all these things come together, the body of work of the consortium is about building organizations that are capable of dealing with disruption and doing it in a seamless way. So we're excited by this because it kind of stitches things together in a bit of a new light. And um, you'll be seeing more work maybe on this and we'll be maybe having some meetings on exploring some of these topics and how we stitch these together. And, and we maybe break up some of the way we talk about our core concepts and principles and, and write those around an adaptive organization. Intelligence warming in 2022. Uh, so we will be re-releasing re Intelligence Warming in 2022 as the Intelligence Warming Practices Guide. We're aligning Intelligence Warming in the way we talk about Intelligence Warming much more to the way we talk about KCS with principles, core concepts. Right now, there's kind of three emerging practices uh, around Intelligence Warming, design techniques, and then an adoption guide. So we're, we're in the process of writing it right now. The more I commit to getting this done, the more pressure I feel to sit down and actually do all the writing that I need to do. There currently are sections in there that just have notes saying Matt or Kelly needs to write this section. So we need to kind of go write those sections. But uh, our goal is to re-release it uh, in probably the March timeframe as um, you know the, the practices guide. And we're also in the process of building an online fundamentals course for intelligence warming and then a fundamentals exam for intelligence warming. So intelligence warming has become a hot topic and we are taking all the learnings from the last several companies that have implemented it to kind of restructure it into a practices guide, which we're, we're pretty excited about. And then some further topics for 2022, and I'd say stay tuned as we begin to kind of get our events organized. And absolutely, if there's topics you're interested in, reach out to us. Um, if you're interested in presenting in a KCS in action call, reach out to us. Or if there are you know, big things going on at your company that you think would be beneficial for the consortium to talk about, let us know. This idea of knowledge-centered success is, um, we're hearing more and more about it, right? So knowledge is a strategic, a strategical enables. So apparently I have a little mistype there. I don't know what a strategical enables is, but a strategic enabler. I think it's coming uh, in 2022, it, stay tuned. It is, just wait. <laughs> gonna, this is what happens when I try to translate things into German, I come up with words like this. Um, but really expanding KCS across the enterprise, we've talked a little bit about it. What are the core concepts that you would have to have in place and how could you structure it to kind of get across the, uh, the enterprise? More and more around recognition models. So, you know, as, and one of the topics that, um, and BMC made this comment at the leadership committee meeting around moving, how do we move from a coaching, how do we move to a coaching, coaching culture from a punitive culture? And, Interesting discussion around one, a punitive, what is a punitive culture um, versus a coaching culture and what does that look like? But how do we recognize people differently? And what does that mean to our thinking on reputation models and maturing our thinking around reputation models? The adaptive organization, what's the product of support, leadership qualities and continuing work on the nurturing and adaptive workforce paper. <clears throat> and KCS coaching, coaching in general, um, we're seeing emerging thoughts on coaching and how companies are designing coaching programs, building coaching teams. Definitely feel that there is some, some great work that we could do to, to learn from each other around what people are doing with, with coaching in their organizations. And, and there's gonna be a, a lot more. So um, some very specific things around KCS, around intelligence warming. And then I'm sure as we go through the year, there'll be some new exploratory topics that come up. And just ending on, you know, that the consortium is made up of a great group of people. We're supported by companies that are willing to share what they're doing and make it available to the world. I often reach out to people saying, oh, we ran across this, this company. They'd be interested in talking to somebody who knows something about this. 
and the number of people that are willing to just go out and share their experiences is awe-inspiring. So thank you again to all of our members and the largest community that make KCS and intelligent swarming and all of these topics such a huge success. So thank you to everybody for a great 2021. And we are very excited for continuing to work with everybody in 2022. Any questions or thoughts on topics for 2022? Any Anything we missed? I see a lot of folks who worked on a lot of those things we talked about. Hey, hi, um, Matt and uh, Kelly. This is Karthik from Ericsson. I think it's been a tremendously uh, learning journey with uh, consortium. We have learned quite a lot and uh, trying to uh, up the maturity level of what we have here. Uh, in fact, we have been trying to uh, implement um, intelligent swarming and uh, we are uh, still at the nascent stage, but I'm really looking forward for that. The other things that you talked about, that one very interesting slide on the predictive customer engagement. I think um, that should be the vision uh, and the future for uh, any uh, support centric organization. I'm just excited as uh, you all for 2022 <laughs> and I'm uh, looking forward to connect more. And thank you so much for all the effort. Thanks, Karthik. It's great to have you with us. Yeah, uh, uh, one question I wanted to ask, I think you missed it. You mentioned about uh, a slide on measurement health uh, right, I mean, there's one slide on. Yep. That's right. And the, um, I'm gonna have to figure out where you can find more information about that. No, um, no, no, I wanted to know that, um, but thanks for helping Kelly. Uh, you said that, you know, some of the organizations volunteered to uh, check the health of their measurements, right? If we wanted mm -hmm. to do that uh, as a member, do we have to, uh, I mean, would we charge uh, anything or how does that work? Nope, you're not not charged to do it. Um, we can reach out after this and kind of talk about why, I mean, you would do most of the work. <laughs> we would, but we can walk you through kind of what what's in the pay, what's in the framework, kind of uh -huh. how to fill it out, the things to think through, and then, you know, maybe talk to you a little bit about while you're, why, how you've filled it out and what you've learned and, and, guide you a little sure. bit through it but yeah yeah no there's no charge for it excellent Matt. thank you thanks kelly well once again thank you everyone look there's no other questions or comments i wish everybody a great holiday season and a happy new year and we will see you in january <laughs>